I'd like to introduce our speaker, and I think a lot of you know her, um, Peggy Ward. Uh, Peggy grew up in the lake country of Wisconsin and has a strong connection with woods, lakes, and the natural world. Peggy has her doctorate in adult education and a master's degree in counseling psychology. She serves on the facility of graduate program in mindfulness leadership at Atlantic, Atlantic University. She has also studied and practiced with many wise Native American elders. Peggy met Thich Nhat Hanh in 1991, became a lay minister in 1994, and an ordained Dharma teacher in 2000. She and Larry joined Thich Nhat Hanh in international exchanges throughout the world and served as staff for 20 years. We're honored to have you as our speaker this morning. Good morning, friends. Can you hear me okay? Okay, thumbs up. I'm uh, amazed to have some colleagues here uh, from Lotus, Kate and Matt and Vivian, who is just recovering from COVID, Dharma teacher from Fort Collins, other friends, uh, Linda from Cleveland, Jen from the East Coast, Suzanne from North Carolina, Pat. So thank you for being here. Um, we always begin in our tradition thanking our teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, and uh, yeah, my, my thanks for my teacher is immeasurable. Um, one time when we were in Thailand uh, visiting a temple where we spent a lot of time, the monk there was called Grandfather. I never did learn any name for him other than Grandfather. Uh, but the first time we came to his temple, he walked us through. We had to do the regular bows in the main temple. Then he took us to a life-size size bronze statue of his teacher. And he, we stood in front of it and bowed and he cried. And he turned to me and said in English, my teacher, my everything. And I just love that. I, I love that memory for me and that that experience and I know that in me uh, and I know how my teacher lives in in all of us so that helps me to see that in all of us and in, in myself too so it's a two-part talk today because as I sat with this um, the first part is about decolonizing Thanksgiving and then the second part will be on some um, the Buddhist teachings research and stories on gratitude I think we're gonna to get to a practice. Um, Vivian's here and Vivian calls me an orange. And by that, she means that I have a hard time preparing things ahead of time. I usually have some notes and often I don't even use them, but I do prepare, honest I do. And uh, then I, I kind of go with, with where we are in this moment. Um, I'm in Karech. Mexico, uh, early land ancestors were the Otomi, she, her pronouns. And what else can I say about this moment? We've uh, just returned from teaching on the ground in person in uh, Minnesota and in uh, Colorado. And it was a real blessing. And we also experienced uh, COVID, even with um, we thought some pretty good controls in place, like you had to have a photocopy of your COVID test and uh, you had, we tested at the door. Um, we suggested masks, but we left that up to people. We tried to distance things, but we still had, I believe six, the uh, second day we had two COVID cases. The third day we had one, the fourth day we had two. Um, so we were really sad and sorry about this and we felt good about what we did at the same time. And as I prepare to teach in Oklahoma, um, I'm meeting with her today. I hope to look at what we can do to help make things safer for people. And there's a blessing in that, that safety. There's a blessing in being together like we are this morning in a way that's safe. 
And I'm rather stunned my two colleagues are here on the Saturday morning. That's gonna make me cry this morning. So thank you, not your fault. It's just how I am. Uh, in the Vietnamese family, I was called daughter of the river. And uh, the white woman who cries all the time was my other password. So let's look at decolonizing Thanksgiving. Um, I, I wanted to be really practical because there's a lot we can study on this and there's beautiful resources available that can help us to study what we've done um, as a country to uh, create myths that are harming to, to, to us all and in particular to Native Americans. And the, the first thing I wanna say that we can do, I've got four points about this. The first one is to learn about our land ancestors. And you can do this easily at a gathering with your family or with others to look and just Google, put in who are the land ancestors for where I live in Columbus or Cleveland or, and you can learn about that. And the kids, the young people will love learning about it. I guarantee this. Um, kids are fascinated with, with Native Americans. Kids are fascinated with dinosaurs and mummies, right? You know that from your kids, dinosaurs, mummies, and Native Americans. And they love to learn about that and the food that was eaten on the land where you're from. Although one time when we created um, acorn soup, it was not a hit, um, but maybe we had the wrong recipe. But Look at, see where you live and the land ancestors that, that were there and recognize in gratitude the work that they did and the presence that they brought to that land. As we look to demythologize Thanksgiving, one of the big things we want to look at is this uh, mythology of the noble beast. Um, how heartbreaking is that? As we study about our land ancestors, we'll learn that they had intricate systems of governance. Um, the Iroquois, for example, had equal power to men and women, but the chiefs were always selected by the women. I love that. Uh, but you'll find there's a lot about trade that, that was learned, governance, um, ways of being. Oh, and this is another thing to demythologize. Um, the mythology with Thanksgiving is that we taught the natives how to eat, eat the food. You know, we gave them our recipe for sweet potatoes. Come on, you know, we need to drop that one. And if anything, uh, they were really, some of them we know were really helpful in teaching the settlers on how to eat and how to use the land, uh, the food that is there. So let's, let's look at telling the real story. And the real story was that if there was a meal at all, there were not women or children at the table. It was, it was men at the table that had guns. And so the atmosphere was rather tense if there was a meal. And some history shows us that there might've been, but it wasn't, it wasn't comfortable because um, the settlers had guns and the native folks didn't. Um, it reminds me of stories that I have still heard about slavery today. I have, I have heard this just this past year from someone that said that slavery was in her family. And part of the story in her family was how great it was that they fed people and great it was that they had a home or a roof over their heads. Then, so this again needs to be demythology. Nobody wants to be a slave. Nobody wants to be enslaved. So tell the real story. Well, we lived in a lay practice community in Santa Barbara with kids and we decided to have a community vegetarian Thanksgiving. And we, we sent the kids off into this special room and asked them to create a skit for us or a song. And we totally, the, the adults totally got out of the way. We totally left that to the kids. So we had our dinner and then as after dinner entertainment was this skit. And the skit, we, we just were so stunned, surprised, and amazed. The skit was a very violent one with the kids killing natives and turkeys. And the, ki the kids did violent, I mean, they did really dramatic death of turkeys. And they did really dramatic death of, of Native Americans until there was just one settler sitting there eating a meal. 
and this wasn't anything we told them to do. In fact, we were, we were hoping to meet our community and meet our neighbors in a graceful way. And uh, we were, we were kind of shocked. This was like, what, 20, 20 years ago that we had this violent <laughs> Thanksgiving skit. But uh, I'll never forget all the turkeys dialing violently because uh, that was the part that really hit the kids. And it, they came up, up with that with their own research, the number of, of turkeys that were killed. So we didn't, we didn't have to coach them on that. They knew what to do. So tell the real stories, learn about our land ancestors who, who came before you here. Um, and then the third practical point is look at locally sourced food. Um, well, when we taught in Minneapolis, a friend of mine, Judith Lies, made a bouquet out of sticks and leaves and rose hips and everything that came from her backyard. And um, we can do that too. Look at what grows in our land, or and that can be part of the education at the table. Um, what what comes from this land? What supports us? That's from our back door. I know in working with herbs, one of the keys was finding the herbs that were out your back door as the ones that would be most healing. So look at that. And then uh, the fourth practical point is, if you're gonna have a dinner, see if you can invite someone from outside of your circle. I grew up with this. Uh, my mom was the only Spanish speaking person that we knew of at one point in our whole county in Wisconsin. And she was connected with a military school um, where a lot of rich, wealthy families from South America and Mexico sent their kids. And so we had them at our house. And we also, the word was out, if you knew somebody Spanish speaking that needed a place for Thanksgiving, that they were welcome at our house. And my mom didn't think a Thanksgiving dinner should happen without having a stranger there. Um, she, she said that be, there's, there's a line in the Bible about that, uh, an angel is hidden in the stranger. And so there was always 20 people. There was always Spanish speaking at our, our table. And there was always a stranger. And after everybody would leave, uh, the family that was left would sit and we'd kind of process what happens with the dinner and invariably, there would be somebody that was there that nobody knew. There would always be, oh, did you bring that person? No, did you bring that person? No, well, where did that person come from? And that was kind of one of the highlights of my family Thanksgiving dinners was seeing if we could figure out who the, the strange angel was. Who was the strange angel that entered our house? So the encouragement is just to see if, if that's possible, somebody from outside your circle. So I just wanted to give these points. And um, again, the encouragement to have you look at it, or if you have kids or you're a teacher, uh, kids will love exploring this. Uh, they'll love learning about what the recipes are from your land. Uh, they'll love learning about what people wore. Um, in, in our area where it's warm, um, the native costumes often have a, a, like a crop top, like from yoga and split middles. And there's a lot of like, uh, kind of like legging pants in this area and really, really, really long feathers that are used in the costuming. And that was one of the things that invaders did was killed these birds. And so I don't know how people are getting these feathers again, there must be some way but learn about the people there and look at how we can change the story, change the story to write a new story about what we did as, as settlers, what we did to colonize the land we're on and what we can do to tell a new story of um, the, the gratitude we have for all the good work that's been done before us and, and the prayers that were on this land and the birds and the food. Okay, so gratitude is deep in this way is a deep spiritual practice, right? We have to cut through the shame or the blame. We have to cut through the guilt. That isn't where we need to go. We need to go right smack dab into love. And if we go right into love, we can find this. We can find this new story. So it's not to shame ourselves or our ancestors or my mom with her 
she she got the biggest turkey she could find. Oh, I got to tell another mom story. Larry and I were living in Mexico and my mom and dad came for Thanksgiving. And all that my mom packed was Thanksgiving dinner. Um, my mom was loved Ziploc bags. She thought that was like one of the best inventions of the last century was Ziploc bags. And so she had gym bags full of Ziploc cranberry relish, cranberry sauce, gravy, stuffing, mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes. And then there was a gym bag with a whole 20 pound turkey. And I was rather horrified when it came off the conveyor belt at the airport because things were dripping. And um, I go, mom, what did you bring? And she was like, so proud of herself. I brought Thanksgiving dinner as a mom, we don't have an oven. You know, we don't have an oven. Oh, we're lucky to have the smallest microwave you've ever seen. So Larry and my dad went out to try to find a chicken roaster place that would fix it. And of course we did. And of course they were delighted. We said, we only want, you know, this much of this, you can have the rest. And I think they charged us, it was like $15 to cook, cook the turkey. And when we went to pick it up, there was a whole crowd of people waiting for their share of the turkey because the roastery had called some of their friends and said, hey, we've got some pavo, we've got some turkey to give away. So that's what I was afraid of, Vivian. I'd get caught on a story like that. And that's why it's hard for me to follow my notes. So back to gratitude comes from the Latin word gratis, G-R-A-T-I-S. And I found that interesting that that also is free. Uh, the word free, it's used for free. It also means grace, graciousness, gratefulness, gratitude. And so those of you that like definitions, it's all kind of blurred. But in Buddhist teachings, we all blur it with the river of goodness that the river of love the river of goodness is what this stream that's called gratitude generosity all flows in and it's a thankful appreciation and this topic to me is a little bit like teaching leadership in that we all know kind of the right answers we've all experienced this and yet to me one of the challenges is how come it's kind of hard to do? I remember as a kid, after Christmas, we were forced to write thank you notes. And my experience as a kid is it was painful. And we put it off and we put it off and we put it off. And I wonder about that. I, I wonder, parents, I think there's a way we can teach it that is, is coming from love. Um, with my kids at school, again, I worked with nursery school through 12. Um, we came up with this handy dandy form for gratitude for the little kids where they could just fill in the line, I like your blank. You know, so we, we with the earlier grades, we had just a simple form of, I like your, I thank you for. And then as we got older with the kids, we used more advanced words I'm proud of, I appreciate, I'm grateful for, I enjoy, I celebrate, I like, I love. So we literally did teaching with this language of appreciation. And I'm, I had assignments in all of the grades and particularly the young little kids. I was shocked at how much they loved this assignment. I gave them one piece of paper and said, you know, pick one person and Picture that person and then uh, here, find one thing you like, one thing you like to do with them. And the minute they got it done, they came running back and they wanted another one. And the minute they did that, they came running back and they wanted another one. And most of the younger kids did at least six. And they'd come back to me and say, well, gosh, I have to do one for my sister. So, okay. Oh, I have to do one for my teacher. Okay. And then some did some for me as they left the room. And mostly with the little kids, it was thank you for your smile, playing Lego with me, um, picking me up after school. Um, but then with the older kids, it got a little bit um, more, there were more words, more stories. So the older kids, I asked them to write a letter. 
there. And with older kids, you had to say at least three paragraphs. And then I used the university rule, a paragraph has to be more than three sentences. So we got really specific um, so that there would be this practice that we put through the whole school. One of the reasons we put this practice through the whole school was because of bullying. We had like all schools that I know of almost um, difficulties with bullies. And as long as we elevate bullies and elect them presidents and directors, we're gonna have to continue to work with bully behavior. But this was one way to teach kids um, to look at gratitude. We know from neuroscience that we can shape our mind with our words, our deeds and our actions. So we were doing some shaping I know this from Buddhist teachings too, that a lot of our practices are about calming and settling. But then as we practice longer, it's more about shaping our mind. So calming's great, stopping's great, breathing's great, but we work to the point where we can shape our mind into one that keeps our feet in the river of goodness. So we're, we're connecting to something larger than ourselves. And one of the Buddhist instructions is to be grateful for everyone. It doesn't say grateful for everything. So we don't have to be grateful for the bomb or the slam or the insult or the bullying, but it, it, it's working for us to be grateful for everyone. And that seeing everyone like Margaret's dog, whose name is Sensei, everyone is a teacher for us. And often what we're upset about is helping us to highlight something that's been in the shadow, something we haven't recognized. So this is how we move into grateful for everyone, not necessarily everything. The everything we can get to eventually with our strong practice. I remember when our house was bombed, I was immediately sent a card that's a Zen saying, Barn burned down, now I can see the moon. And the minute I got it, I thought, well, I hope to get there. <laughs> I wouldn't admit, I wouldn't suggest starting there with some, but, but we get to that point um, with our practice. Uh, and, and the gratitude has to begin with ourselves first. Again, that's a key teaching of, of Buddhism is we start with ourselves. So I wanted to mention a few of the research pieces that all coincide with the Buddhist teachings. Um, there's been a lot of research. Harvard's done it quite a bit. A gentleman named Robert Emmons, E-M-M-O-N-S, has three books out right now that have been co-authored with, I think, different graduate students. I think he still gets to be the top name. But it is looking at the research that, that's been done on gratitude. And one of the things that's popped out at me was that a lot of the research has people writing letters of gratitude. And what they've learned is that the person does not have to send the letters for the person to receive the blessing of that practice. Interesting, huh? So you just have to write it or name it or say it to yourself. And there's a shift that occurs. The researchers have, have also found that it takes time to work with gratitude for it to have the biggest impact. And by time, when they did four-week studies, it wasn't as potent as eight-week studies. So there's a, in neuroscience, we know there's something that shifts with the brain when we start to train our mind to look at gratitude. And all of you know this is true, right? You all know this. You've seen what happens to yourself. Uh, the research indicates, like the Buddhist did, indicates, it's start, do something early in the day. Do something when you get up. Early, early. So your whole day can kind of go into that channel. And it's recommended that you do something before you go to bed. A phrase, a mantra, a saying, um, a poem, a song. Um, Something that will get you on the in the river of goodness. That'll put your feet in the river of gratitude. 
Makes sense, right? I, I told the Colorado group about my when I was dating Larry and my first time in the hood um, in Cleveland, Larry hadn't told me, but his dad used to wake up and just literally scream, just scream. Thank you, Lord, for waking me up. And just woke, woke us right out of bed. Uh, and uh, Larry looked at me and he goes, yeah, he does this every morning. He does this every morning. So what a way to wake up. In the Thich Nhat Hanh tradition, we have a morning chant. And one of the things we've done with it is encourage people to make it their own. So that means if you have a four note range, re redo the chant. If you have a 10 note range, redo the chant. It's something that really nourishes you. I have a, in, in Canada, we called good students keeners. I don't know, Matt, if that still happens. Do you call them keeners? You do. Yeah, well, I have, I have a keener Dharma student in, in Utah, and he, he's been working on the morning chant, and he wants my feedback as a teacher on how he did. And I never know what to tell him, because the fact that he's working on it is enough goodness for me. It, it's, it's perfect. If you want to make it more perfect, you do that. But it is perfect the way you're doing that. So keener students, whatever makes you smile, whatever helps your heart to light up, the incense of your heart to light up with gratitude, that's how to begin the, the day. I have some notes on the other research. <laughs> I love this. This was a researcher language. That uh, gratitude practice unshackles us from toxic emotions, unshackles. How about that? Um, and that gratitude helps us even if we don't share it. Although I, I, I think there's great benefits to sharing it. Uh, the benefits take time. There's lasting effects and impact on the brain. And this is what we found at our school system when we started really going down the route of kindness. We made kindness a priority. We made gratitude a priority. We had less detentions. We had less students sent home and we had less reports of bullying. And that was good. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, less depression, more well-being, uh, better sleep. Um, more trust in strangers. Um, so this is all from the Harvard research that, um, as Emerson said, that gratitude is heaven itself. So why don't we do it? How many of you have kept a gratitude journal at any point in your life? Hands up. Yeah. Yeah, so those of us that have know it works. And you also know you sometimes ran into yourself, right? Um, if, I, if I had a goal of saying five a day, there are some days when I put that I'm breathing, you know, that, that I'm alive. And that's a starting point. And there are some days when I could reps go on more and say more. But I'd be curious to know if anybody wants to put in the chat room what you learned through your practice of the gratitude journal. And I'll look for that in a few seconds. But um, for me, I used that practice. And I also used, I had a watch that beeped every 15 minutes. And I used that practice to help me turn around when I was in a really difficult place with anger and rage after our house was bombed. And so I, I really needed to do something really strong because uh, I could feel the fire of anger and rage in me. And I knew that that would destroy me and destroy my life if I didn't turn it around. And so this was when I did the, the journal. I think it was more than a year I did it. But I also kept the watch a couple of years. And sometimes I found that little beep just so annoying. That's when I knew I was still angry. <laughs> you know, it's like, ah, oh, uh, what's that noise? Oh, it's me. Ah, oh, I hate that noise. Anyhow, but then, okay, here's my friend. 
helping me practice with gratitude to recognize I'm alive. Um, the Buddhist teachings go back to a lot of the filial responsibility that we begin with honoring our mother and father. And that's been a hard one in the United States. Uh, and there's something there for us. There's a treasure for us because we wouldn't be here, right? Without our mom and dad. So if we can dig down to the fact that I'm breathing because of my mother and father, I'm here now because of my mother and father. Yeah, does that make sense? So to dig into that. In the Thich Nhat Hanh tradition, we have a present moment, wonderful moment, gata. In out deep, slow, calm, ease, smile, release. Present moment, wonderful moment. And sometimes the moment isn't, doesn't feel so wonderful. And so then we practice, like with the parents, to go back to, it's the only moment. And this was really useful for me when I worked as a chaplain, because it wasn't a wonderful moment if someone was in the hospital. It wasn't a wonderful moment if uh, on the surface, but we could get to the only moment. And that's a really precious place. Like right now, this configuration of lovely beings, this is going to probably be the only moment we'll ever be together like this. This configuration, these folks, who knows when we'll see each other again or if ever. Will ever will we see each other again? I don't know. But touch into that. And that makes it particularly precious. You know, somehow our consciousness brought us here this morning and we're together. And we're looking at gratitude. We're looking at decolonizing our mind. That's that's a precious thing. I find it very precious that people will sit together with me in silence. I think it was one of the things I most missed with COVID. I love going into a Zendo and shutting my eyes and then hearing some rustle and wondering who's going to be there when I open my eyes. You know, it's just like kind of being in nature and hearing the rustling in the, in the woods. Who's going to be sitting here in, in silence with me? And it's, it's a precious thing that we do that. It's a very beautiful thing. And it's a very beautiful thing that we're at the Great Trees and Women's Temple together. That is a rare and precious thing in any country, but in particularly in America. And that we have Tejo, who's been a monastic celibate sister for more than 30 years. Wow, what a Dharma treasure. She's in LA today, I'll, she'd be here. She sent me a note and I'll be at Great Tree in just a few weeks. So that, that's a precious thing that I want us all to touch in on. Uh, the courage of the community of Tejo, um, the many years of commitment that Tejo has made and the Great Tree has paid off their mortgage. Uh, the great joy that the community I believe so. I hope I'm not. I think that is that true, Lorna. Give me a big head nod if I lied. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want to get that story out because we're still looking for money, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so thank you to this community. So let's see. Um, the Buddhist teachings also suggest that gratitude is a protection. And I want you thinking about that. What does that mean? What does that mean? Our um, trip back from Colorado was fraught with difficulties, um, mostly because the airlines were short staffed. I think they're trying to keep the staff around for Thanksgiving. So this week in their life, it was short staffed. And so all of our flights were late by over two hours. And we had extra time sitting on the planes and we missed our plane to Mexico. And throughout the day, we had people that were difficult and people that were wonderful. 
And I really felt the merit of our retreat practice because I could feel how normal a day I had, a normal day with wonderful people and challenging people and wonderful people and watching my mind because I could have gone down the rabbit hole with the challenging one. The American Airlines customer service was particularly rude. There was a guy there in front of us in line that I felt was close to dying with a heart attack. And I had to get, we had to get him to a chair. Um, and I told him I'd keep his place in line for him. Um, but that was a particularly tough spot, but we had a couple that bought our lunch. Why? We don't know. I think that was that overcoat of, of goodness, uh, that protection of gratitude. That reminder that whatever happened that two days that it took us to get home, that we were cared for, we were safe. It might not have been the plan I had. And then this going back to Buddhist teachings, expectations get us in trouble, right? We think, oh, well, I'm going to get home like the paper says at 7.05. No, you're going to get home the next day, <laughs> so, <laughs> but you'll be safe. You'll be cared for. You'll be protected because uh, life is good. So I wanted to do, uh, let's see if I missed any points. Oh, the, um, the Buddhist teachings too talk about a courage that comes from our practice of gratitude. This is another thing I want you to think about. What, have you experienced the courage of living a grateful life? I remember years ago, uh, the story that's coming up is kind of a silly one, but I had a happy childhood. And as a therapist, especially in training and in the 70s, this was not a popular thing. <laughs> it was like people thought I was in denial. Um, you know, I, I, I got so that I didn't need to defend it, but I did recognize how grateful I am, this protection. And I also felt compassion that not everybody had this. This wasn't anything to make me superior or inferior or, or the same, but I did have this protection of being loved and wanted by my mom and my dad. And, uh, I didn't care what, I had different supervisors that thought I was in denial. Happened again when I was in chaplain residency. Uh, she thought I was in denial too. And I didn't even get any offense at that. I thought, no, <laughs> I had a happy childhood. I grew up in the Lake country of Wisconsin and we played together. And even in high school, we took group ski trips and did things together. It was very good hot childhood. So I can feel gratitude for that. Okay, so the other thing with generosity, it's this inner quality and it's about letting go. It's really not a doing. It's a letting go. It's a releasing. It's a relaxing. Now that makes sense? I want you to practice with that one too. We did a whole retreat on that this fall. Some of you were at, we're gonna do one again in January with releasing into, into love, undoing into love. So we don't have to do anything, but we do have to relax our expectations, relax our tiredness, relax our weariness, whatever we need to relax. Okay, so enough talk. Let's just settle in for a really short little sit. I don't know if I dare try my music now or maybe at the end, madam. Be ready in case I mess up at the end here. Breathe in and breathe out with an audible sigh. Sissy, I think I was talking too fast, so let that go. My beloved teacher always spoke slowly. But feel the spaces in between with your breath as you settle in. Dropping in. 
the miracle of this moment. This ordinary only moment. With the out breath continuing to release. Letting go, knowing you'll remember maybe one thing that was useful and the rest can just fly away. And in this precious only moment, aware of our breath, that we're alive. And in this precious moment, this only moment, touching into the fact that we're in community. And in this present moment, this precious moment, aware that we're safe. And in this present moment, precious moment, feeling our free to feet in the river of goodness, river of gratitude. And in this only moment, tapping into the generosity generosity of our Buddhist teachers, Thich Nhat Hanh, Katagiri Roshi, and others, in the 2,600 years of keeping these teachings alive, As you continue to breathe, I'm going to try playing this song. Thanks for the wind.
I didn't want to check the chat room before I left to see what happened. Grateful for the teacher and the gratitude. All the goods in our life helps, especially the smaller but important things we often overlook. The taste of our toothpaste, water from the faucets. I struggle with sticking to the practice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And... Uh, Appreciate getting to be together. Lorna, do you say something or? Yes, usually um, if there's no questions or anything else that people want to say, we have a uh, closing sutra. 
It's um, a Thich Nhat Hanh Closing Sutra. It's the call and response. And since Zoom doesn't handle multiple voices at a time, um, if I start it, will you um, respond, Peggy? Yes. And by the way, thank you very much for your talk today. May the merit of this practice. May the merit of this practice. Benefit all beings. Benefit all beings. And bring peace. And bring peace. Thank you. Thank you. And I added that song was from called Thanksgiving Song from David Campbell, Campbell C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. And you can find it online. And thanks, Matt, being ready to cover in case my new Yeti speaker didn't do it. But blessings to everybody. And Happy thanks Thanksgiving, y'all. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Peggy, when are you coming to North Carolina? It's December something. Um, Come to Great Tree or somewhere else? I'll be staying at Great Tree and I'll be at Tejo's like from a Monday to Saturday. Um, it's I think like December 11th or something like that. So will you be giving a talk or just coming for a retreat for yourself? 